Welcome to Mastering VMware vSphere 6, Chapter 2. In this chapter, we're focusing very heavily on the planning and installation of ESXi. So one of the big things is, why do we have to understand what ESXi is? Well, in order to understand how virtualization works within vSphere and vCenter, we have to realize that there has to be a thin type client or some type of software that sits on top of the hardware that will actually provide the virtualization platform. And that's part of what ESXi does. It gives us a lot of the basic level of instructional sets that we're going to need for our virtualization to run on the hardware. It is a light version of Linux that, again, uh, allows us to do the virtualization. By understanding what ESXi is, we can better support it. We can understand its compatibility requirements. And the big thing here is we can plan how to use it. So let's look at some of the requirements. So part of the ESXi requirements is you have to understand the VMware HCL, the hardware compatibility list. Basically, you want to make sure what servers connect to what. That way you have a full understanding of exactly what hardware you can use. Basic normal hardware for ESXi, you want normally a dual core chip, preferably 64-bit. Even the 32-bit will work, but 64 is better. You want minimum 8 gigs of RAM. That's not required, but again, this is going to be the preferred method. At least 1 gigabit NIC and some type of fast storage. It doesn't have to be centralized storage. It just has to be storage. We're going to talk about centralized storage here shortly, but as long as there's storage, it will work. A big thing is understanding the right hardware that your infrastructure will run off of. So we have to understand differences between a few different types of servers, like a rack server versus a blade server or a blade chassis. And this is one issue where a lot of people get kind of confused. A rack mount will actually still go uh, into a rack server where the blades actually go perpendicular to the ground. So racks go parallel, they go with the ground, blade servers actually go perpendicular. Now that's not always true, but on most blade chassis that I've seen, that is the case. Other things we have to discuss, because once you under kind of understand what servers you're going to be using, you're going to be looking at what type of storage you want to be using. And again, normally, traditional storage architecture is going to be some type of SAN or some type of traditional array, whether it be physically on the server or centralized storage. The benefit to centralized storage is that the storage is not on the individual hosts. So if a physical host goes down, then you don't have to worry about replacing that physical host because none of the VMs are technically stored there. The host just acts as memory and processing power. All that information is being pulled from that centralized storage. Uh, so we also have this thing called hyper-converged, which is a nice hybrid of everything, but it gets even more complex. With vSphere 6, we also have what's called a virtual SAN, which basically is storage that's used on each individual hosts that actually acts as a virtual SAN connection. That way, again, if a host go, does go down, um, you can still function without it. We're going to get more into that in one of the later chapters, but I did want to put that out there. So let's talk about what type of communication we're going to need. Traditionally, a one gig Ethernet would suffice. However, we're starting to see we're starting to see the mass amounts of data throughput that our VMs are requiring because we're doing more and more VMs per physical host, and a single gigabit or even a bonded pair of gigabit connections off of the server is getting harder and harder to work with. So what they've done is they started doing 10 gigabit, and actually 10 gigabit deployments have become very commonplace within the data center environment. A big thing here is with our physical connections, 
we have to be able to plan out which one is going to be data, which one is going to be high availability, which one is going to be maybe vMotion or other managerial functionality or, or other just vSphere functionality. So it's not always, well, we have a server, we have one NIC, we're good. Sometimes we may deploy a, a server that will have a quad NIC and we specify vNIC or uh, NIC 1 and NIC 2 will be data. NIC 3 will be our centralized storage. NIC 4 might be our high availability or our fault tolerance. Well, we have redundant data, but we don't have redundant con uh, connectivity to the storage. So we may end up putting two quad NICs in it. Um, on most of my deployments, it's very common. Uh, I deployed all, a lot of Dell servers. So they have their built-in quad NIC, and automatically I install a second quad NIC just in case. And again, I put one data on the built-on, one data on the add-on. One iSCSI on the built-on, one iSCSI on the add-on. That way I'm trying to minimize a single part or a single point of failure. If the built-on board dies or the built-on NIC dies, not a problem. It starts communicating through the add-on card. If the add-on card dies, it routes traffic to the built-on one. So there are some nice features there, but it goes back to planning. A little thing is the book does go a little bit more in depth about choosing the appropriate type of switching fabric. Uh, they also bring out things like fiber channel over ethernet and load balancing. Right now, this isn't really the networking chapter, so I didn't really touch on them. The book goes a little bit more in depth in that regard, so I did want to point that out. All right, moving on. It's actually the deployment or the deploying of ESXi. We can do this one of three ways. We have an interactive, which is pretty much you put the medium in the server and you install it like a traditional installation. We have a network boot, which is a PXE boot, or we have a auto deploy. If you're familiar with VMware's 5 or 5.5, the auto deploy sometimes had some issues and you had to have certain policies and a profile set up. So auto deploying has gotten better and we're going to talk more about auto deploy in chapter three, but I did want to bring that up now just to point out, hey, it's still here and it is getting better. We also have the traditional desktop clients. When it comes to management of our uh, vSphere's, for example, we have the legacy desktop client, which is the Windows only client, very commonly called the C client. Uh, it can fully edit VMs to the hardware 9 version. It can only partially edit any hardware 10 or 11 version. 10 and 11 hardware version were in VMware 5.1 and above. So if you have a VM where the hardware level is set to 10, your legacy, uh, your legacy client may not be able to edit it. You have to use the web client to do the editing. The desktop client does connect both to a vCenter and or the traditional ESXi. So sometimes the old client does work really good with old plugins and it's very favorable by many people. The web client is not the greatest, but it has gotten a lot better since 5.5.1 and 5.5. A fun fact is you can actually also do unattended installation of ESXi by providing it a installation script. As more of a nidbit, we will get to that in a later chapter when we start talking about deployment and auto deployment a little bit more in depth. So the importance of name resolution, we want to make sure that DNS is set up correctly. You also have to understand networking, IPv4 and IPv6. This is important because sometimes vSphere actually calls things by name. And if you're just using like Google's DNS, your local DNS settings may not work or 
even your local domain names may not work. We have had several instances of deployments where we've set up DNS within a current infrastructure that mapped to their Active Directory. And then on their ESXi hosts, they mapped all of those to Google's DNS and they started having more and more login issues. And it's like, yeah, because you're logging in the domain credentials and it doesn't understand what the domain is because Google's DNS doesn't recognize your domain. So DNS is a huge part of troubleshooting here. Also, time. One big thing that many people end up screwing up majorly is the setting of time. When you set up any type of vSphere or virtualization, you want to make sure that time is set correctly because the VMs that you're uh, running are going to pull the date and time from the ESXi host. Typically, you can turn that off, but most people don't. So I did want to point that out. I have noticed I've had some domain controllers that I ran as VMs, and they were running the time of ESXi. So as those physical boxes got slower, or their time started getting slower, so did all the VMs on them. So that did lead to a time issue. Again, the chapter actually goes way more in depth about auto-deploying. So I did want to point that out. You do want to cover auto-deploying on or in the text. That's one thing that I'm not covering quite yet. It talks about creating image profiles and deployment rules and ensuring availability. We've already talked about post-installation configuration using the desktop client. We haven't really talked about the web client yet, but the web client is still there. How do you get the desktop client? Actually, if you go to the IP address of any ESXi host, you can download the desktop client there, or go to the, the host, and it will actually kick you back to VMware's website. Reconfiguring the management network. Again, part of uh, the virtualized platform is you can actually separate traffic. You can put them on different uh, switches, put them on different VLANs. It is a virtual world that general networking still applies. So you can actually sec uh, separate management traffic on individual NICs, individual VLANs, because again, your physical NIC at this point, coming off of a ESXi host, can act as a trunk if you set it up correctly. And that's a very common thing. We talked about name resolution. All right, so let's go ahead and let's do a recap. You have to make sure you understand the hardware compatibility lists. Make sure that you plan your deployments. Look at things like existing computing power and storage. What licenses you're going to need. And again, how to configure DNS and NTP. Those are one of the first things that you want to do before anything else. That's actually it for this chapter. Again, I want to thank you.